Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is from the incredible mind of Annie Marie Morgan from over on Reddit, No Sleep. And as ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. Why it really does help out the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story, entitled The Ralston Family Disappearance. Let's get straight into that. This was years and years ago, when I was just 11 when it happened, but I'll try to remember it as best I can. We were on a family vacation. Well, really two family vacations. It was just us and the Ralstons. And they had two children, a daughter about my age, named Angie, and a baby named Candy. We both had a mum and a dad still in the picture. My dad couldn't get off work though, so I was supposed to protect my mum and be the man of the family during the trip. Well, we were going to Yellowstone. It looked like a beautiful place, but I'd never been, not after what happened. And since there were six of us, we took two cars, me and my mum in one and the Ralston family in another. We could have crammed into one if we had to, but... It would have been noisy and crowded, and when me and Angie were in a car together on a road trip, our parents could have expected at least two hours of the song that never ends, and enough punch buggy to drive anyone crazy. Me and Angie had little radios to call each other though, and we coordinated the rest stops and food stops. It was going to be a two-day drive, so we were less worried about the first day, as we had plans to stay in a motel that night anyway. But on the second day, we wanted to make sure that when we got to Yellowstone, we were following each other closely so that we could stop and sightsee together. And we lost them halfway through, day two. I mean, Angie had been on the radios, talking about the animals we were going to see and which ones we thought would let us pet them. I remember Angie saying, I'd like to pet a bear. I think they're cute. Over. I didn't want to burst her bubble, even though I thought that it might be a bad idea, so I suggested, well, the buffaloes might be nicer, and it looks soft. Over. My mum didn't burst either of our bubbles about that, though I'm sure she would have lost her mind if we actually tried. Are you scared about sleeping in the woods? Over? Angie asked. And I remember passing their car as she said this. They were slowing down, but I wasn't sure why. Nah, I've been camping before. It's not scary, but I didn't say over just yet. And I watched them slow even more behind us, and I wondered if they had a flat tire or something. Or maybe Mr. Ralston needed to pee. But I remember it was a particular thick area of brush, and I was worried about the animals. We were on a smaller highway, and the trees were actually bending over the road, making it deceptively dark. And I remember I hadn't noticed that at all, until I started to worry about them. Why are you guys stopping? Over. Oh, I don't know. Dad is being silly. And then she said louder, Dad, I said what's going on? And I heard the voice of Mrs. Ralston in the background. She sounded like she'd just woken up. Angie was holding a button down until she had an answer for me, and so I could hear everything. Dad, what? And then she cut off. Her voice anyway. But she was still holding down the button. The conversation that came next is something that I'll never forget. Well, they were out of view, so I didn't get to see any of what was happening. The car door opened and I heard Mrs. Ralston speak more clearly. What are you doing, Jared? Jared? Don't go out there. And then Angie spoke up. Mummy, what's that? But Mrs. Ralston was too entrenched in whatever was happening outside to listen to her daughter. Oh, Lord! Oh, God! She yelled. And then I heard her scream. And I heard Angie say, Daddy? And with a creak of the car door, Angie's finger lifted off the button. It was only then that I thought to tell my mum that there might be trouble. I told her what had just happened, but I don't think I was making very much sense. I pleaded with my mum to turn around and to see what was happening, but she just told me, We're not going to do that, honey, but don't worry, they'll be okay. As an adult, I understand now. I was just a kid back then, and this was before cell phones. If there was some kind of real danger happening, she had opted to get me to safety. I remember her being decidedly tense, but trying not to show it. She pulled over at the next rest stop, and to me, it felt like an eternity, 
and so I really have no idea how long we were driving for after Angie cut out. I tried to radio her a few times on the drive over, but nothing happened. I asked my mum if we should call the police, but she said that she just wanted to give it a little time first. Looking back now, she probably just thought Angie's parents were having a fight. She probably didn't want to get involved. We sat with our car, pulled into a spot facing the road. And my mum assured me that if we got separated, the plan had been to meet at the next rest stop. And so they should be checking in anyway. I vowed not to take my eyes off the highway, just in case. But the hot afternoon sun beat down as the minutes and probably hours ticked by. And pretty soon, I was dozing. I woke up to my mum shaking me and feigning excitement. Even as a child, I could recognise the insincerity. Look, she said. They're back. It was sunset now, and the van was pulling up next to us. Mum was nervous, now I think, because she was expecting to see Mrs. Ralston with a black eye or hiding some bruises. I don't remember if there was any indication of abuse with Angie's parents, or if Mum had just latched onto what would have made sense. What I heard over the radio could very well be interpreted at the start of a fight. But that's, well, that's not at all what came out of that van. I think we must have been in shock, and that's why we didn't do anything. I don't know. I mean, what the hell are you supposed to do when you see something that just doesn't seem to fit within the rules of our world? The driver's side door opened, and Mr. Ralston stepped out. I only knew it was him, or thought I knew it was him because he was so much taller than Mrs. Ralston, and of course the children. But he was covered head to toe in bandages. He looked like a movie mummy or someone from a soap opera about to reveal a brand new face. He didn't have sunglasses though, just a dark gauze of fabric covering his eyes. He was wrapped under the white gauze that covered his face, making it look like he had two misshapen, solid black eyes. The passenger door opened and the rest of the family walked out. Mrs. Ralston was holding candy and they were bundled up as well. Angie stumbled out, her bandages particularly sloppy. And Mr. Ralston opened the door to my car and I felt a chill creep up my spine. I'll drive, thank you, he said to my mum. I started laughing. This had to be a joke. Some kind of elaborate prank. I mean, what other explanation was there? Uh, yes, very funny, my mum said, but she didn't sound amused. I said, I'll drive. Mr. Ralston repeated again. Thank you. And with that, he grabbed my mother's arm. Oh, uh, okay, sure. My mum got out and said to Mrs. Ralston, who feigned levity, I didn't know Jared was such a jokester. Mrs. Ralston did not respond, but she opened the passenger door and grabbed my arm. I got a closer look at the bandages and realised that they were dirty. And near the start of her arms and legs, there was a tiny bit of brownish red seeping through. I didn't know what to think about that, so I just got out of the car. She took her place, and me and my mum exchanged looks. My mum forced a smile, and we piled into the back. Angie followed suit, stumbling. Her eyes were similarly blacked out. Mr. and Mrs. Ralston took up their seats up front, and I sat in the back with my mother and Angie in the middle. Mrs. Ralston handed Canny back to Angie, who handed her back to me. We didn't have a baby seat, so I just held her. But very quickly, I realised that something felt wrong with Candy. Uh, the best way that I could describe it is that she felt very solid. Like you know when you're holding a cat or a dog or a baby. You feel the joints pressing at the elbows and the skin shifts over the bones. You can feel that it's a living creature with moving parts. You might not be aware of this when you're holding something living, but what I was holding, well, I had none of that and it stood out. Candy's arms did not feel like skin. It was attached to muscle and could move. They were just like solid, unmoving lumps of meat. And my thoughts were interrupted by the sound of the car starting. And I grabbed Candy closer. Okay, yeah, yeah, very funny. My mum said as Jared started the car. Mrs. Ralston, still silent. And holding that baby that was so wrong in such a strange way. I began to worry. But it was all so strange that I also thought that maybe I was dreaming and that made me worry less. Jared started pulling the car out of the spot. Jared! My mum yelled. 
Stop that. This isn't funny anymore. And I should have been worrying about if he could even see, or if that were even was Mr. Raston under there. But all I could focus on was the very, very wrong baby I was holding in my hands. She wasn't moving at all. I brought her closer to my chest and said softly, Candy? And then I put my hand on her chest and felt neither the gentle rise and fall of breathing or the soft beating of a tiny heart. I pressed firmer still and couldn't feel even a suggestion of ribs under there. It was like someone had carved out just a baby-shaped hunk of meat from some larger creature. Angie? I grabbed her shoulder. She was in the seat in front of me. I think something's wrong with Candy. My mum was pleading with Mr. Ralston now. Really? This is dangerous. This has gone on long enough. Debbie, tell him this isn't funny. We were pulling out into the road, but that all felt distant to me. Angie! I grabbed her shoulder harder and noticed a splash of reddish-brown liquid seep out into the bandages right where her arm connected to her torso. Mr. Ralston was taking a left turn now, taking us back to where they had stopped, where whatever had happened to them was waiting to happen to us. Listen, it's fine. Just driving back, Mr. Ralston said, and I struggled to remember if that had been what he sounded like. He didn't talk much. Just driving back. No worrying. Okay, Mrs. Ralston parroted. And with that, Angie finally turned around. The black, misshapen gauze of her eyes looked completely opaque. I didn't know how Mr. Ralston could see. The voice that spoke from her was that of a young girl, but oh, it did not sound quite like Angie. Baby, it's fine. Oh, I really don't think she is, Angie. I think we need to go to a hospital. Angie's black wrapped eyes looked at Candy, or whatever I was holding. The baby is for scientific research. What the fuck? I didn't even think about swearing in front of my mum, and that somehow made the whole thing feel even more dire. Mum, what's going on? It'll be fine, sweetie. Don't worry. My mum replied. And then she turned to the thing pretending to be Mrs. Ralston. Debbie, what's my birthday? She grabbed her and looked concerned, no doubt feeling the same inhuman texture I felt under those bandages. When is my birthday, Debbie? It'll be fine, sweetie, the thing answered. And as I got a closer look at Mrs. Ralston for the first time, I noticed that something was absolutely not right about her head. It went on for, well, too long. From the top of her crown to where her chin should be, it looked drawn out and stretched. But maybe her hair wrapped tightly on the top of her head, under there, was just given the illusion. Though looking at the rest of her, I realised it looked like as if she wasn't wearing any clothes under the wrappings. I looked over at Angie and noticed the same thing. She always wore baggy hoodies and loose jeans and the form should have been much lumpier under there. Well, the idea of them stripping down to their underwear or even less for this joke, or it disturbed me greatly. But all I could see of Mr. Ralston was the back of his head, and I became aware of how large it seemed, and very round, almost perfectly round, as if underneath those bandages someone had cut off his head and placed a basketball. I pictured the bandages on Candy's face and was able to peel them up and over one eye. Her skin was sickly looking, but the eyes were blue, like Candy had. I was sure she was dead at that point. Mum, what do we do? I asked the trees crept closer on the highway. I felt like if we got to the place where the trees bowed over the road, the place where the Rastons had stopped, it would all be over. Uh, just sit still, honey. It'll be fine. My mum said, but she was unbuckling her seatbelt. I looked down at Candy, ready to tell my mum that I thought, well, that I thought that she might be dead. But then that blue eye blinked. What happened next is all a blur. I know my mum jumped up and tried to grab the will from Mr. Ralston after that, and, but I don't remember that. I just remember waking up after the crash. Angie was dragging me through the woods, or whatever was underneath those bandages was dragging me. The way she was walking, it looked as if one of her legs was longer than the other. I blinked the blood out of my eyes and wiped my wet hair off of my forehead, and it all came back fast. 
I looked around and Mr. Ralston was dragging my mum into the woods alongside me. She looked like she was asleep. Mrs. Ralston was limping behind, carrying candy loosely by one leg, holding her dangerously low to the ground. I craned my neck and I could still see the car smoking up against the tree, not too far away now. The road was still in sight. I struggled against the thing holding me, much stronger than Angie had been. She had a firm grip on my shoulders, making it difficult to turn around. And then I remembered the bloody liquid that had come out of her shoulder. I struggled up closer to her, standing up for just a second, and punched blindly behind me, hoping I'd hit the joint. She stumbled on her misshapen legs and let me go. Mum! I yelled, trying to wake her as I stumbled towards her. Her eyelids fluttered, but didn't open. I went for Mr. Rasson's knees, kicking out from the back of one, and he fell. I grabbed Mum and shook her, and her eyes shut open, and she looked at the thing that had been dragging her. Oh, God, she said, the events of the past few minutes no doubt coming back to her. I watched a sickly brown-green liquid come out from the area where I kicked Mr. Ralston's knee. Come on, I grabbed a hold of my Mum's hand and we sprinted to the road. The creatures either didn't follow us or were too slow to catch us. We made it to the highway and sprinted across. We ran onto the shoulder, flagging down cars, but also trying to put more distance between us and those things. Someone stopped for us and quickly took us to the police station. It didn't question me, and I don't know what my mum told them, but I know they never found the Raston's car, and the Raston family have been gone ever since. Well, that was 20 years ago now, and really, I don't think about it too much. After a while, I started to think that maybe something else happened, and my brain decided to make it more strange, more abstract as some kind of trauma response. And my mum passed away a few years after, so I could never revisit what she remembered. I never really liked dwelling on the whole thing. But the reason I am delving back into this and why I wanted to try and tell someone else is because of something that happened just yesterday. I've been dragged on a few camping trips through the years, but always with big groups and always, always in crowded spots. And I think that it helped me to start to think even more that I had imagined what had happened, and that there wasn't anything to be afraid of in the woods. That there wasn't anything sinister lurking off the side of the road on long car trips. I still didn't like the idea of camping, and the woods never really felt safe to me, but I'd grown more used to it. Even let my girlfriend convince me to go winter camping with her. She thought that it would be romantic, and I was not about to turn down a romantic night in a tent with her. It was only one night, after all, and we both loved the snow, so I thought it could be fun. I begrudgingly agreed to finding a walk-in site in the far south of us. This was in the Midwest, and though the trip to Yellowstone did cross my mind at the prospect of a more secluded trip to the woods, I was thinking, whatever happened that day, I was on the other side of the country. But when we turned off the highway onto the winding country roads, well, things felt different. The foothills and their encroaching trees felt somehow more sinister. And although it was the middle of the day, and nothing bad is supposed to happen in the middle of the day, I felt exceedingly nervous when we entered the forest. The car behind us turned off and suddenly we were alone on the road. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was very wrong. The hills cut the reception to our radio and static crackled out. I reached over to turn it off, but before I could, we heard a voice come through, and it took me a second to recognize it. And the voice said, Are you scared about sleeping in the woods? And those words brought back all those terrible memories, and I slowed the car down, processing what I had just heard. Then the static cracked once again for, Over? And with that, and turned around. And my girlfriend started asking what was wrong and I shushed her. And she obliged seeing how serious I was. Quietly then, as we reached the Fry's perimeter, we heard, Don't go. Please don't leave me here. And as we passed the start of the trees, we heard her voice once again. And Angie said softly, I'm still scared of sleeping in the woods. I'm still so scared.
Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Certainly another one. Wow. What a skin-crawling, creepy tale that was from the incredible mind of Annie Marie Morgan from over on Reddit, No Sleep. A mighty thank you to you, Annie, for remembering my message to you many months ago. Really do appreciate you remembering my request. And of course, I really hope you enjoyed my rendition and look forward to more of your work in the future. Well, guys and girls, what a mystery that one was. Of course, as ever though, please do let us know down below what you thought. Please do like and share. Why, it really does help out the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. Now, if you think you can pen the next big hit, then please do get in touch with me at the contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail.com. I really look forward to hearing from you. As always, guys and girls, thank you for bearing with my struggles and the ups and downs of life. I promise you the worst has passed now, and I'm making headway to a calmer, more settled home. As ever, a huge thank you to the Cryptic crew for sticking by me for so many months of irregular uploads and lack of content. I hope you're all having a fantastic week at work or school and enjoying a beautiful summer sun and getting plenty of fresh air. But above all, guys, remember, be safe, not sorry.